Hello, welcome to Around the World with Joshua and Alyssa. Today we are going to go back and show you some more things in Athens, and then we're going to, well, after the missionary story, we're going to tell you about another ministry that has to do with ASL, one that I told you about a couple episodes ago, but we're actually going to do it now. So let's get right into this Athens uh, thing that we're going to show you. This is the Acropolis that we have shown you before, the flyover view. Nearby, about a half mile away, maybe a little less than that, is the Acropolis Museum, where you can go to learn about this, its history, how they built it, how it fell apart, and everything else in between. And you can also see lots of things that used to be there, like in the temples or in the different places, and they now have them in the museum. Yeah, and we're going to show you some of those things. So what's really neat about this entrance to the museum, you can't see it from here, but between those two pillars is this view. And so you walk up and there's this a walkway around it, around those pillars, and down below you can see these excavations that have been done of the city below. I think too some of the floor is glass, so like you can kind of look through it and see. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I think it might be more on that left side, mm -hmm. uh, but it's like really thick glass so you're just walking over this and looking down. But this one's actually open, so you can get some good pictures of it. So after you get past all that and you go inside, this is the view inside. Um, not much to say about that, I guess, but on the way up these steps before you get to the main viewing gallery, uh, there are some sculptures. And so this one on the left is a sculpture of a man who is like a actor in theater. And so he actually has there on his, around his shoulder, um, uh, I forget exactly what's what he what is on top of him, but to the right of him is a mask, uh, and so they would wear masks when they did their theatrical productions, and so that's what that is there. This owl on the right, this is part of a seat that was probably in one of those temples up there on the Acropolis, and so if you can imagine, kind of like a big throne, and then. Underneath each of the armrests is an owl, kind of like holding up the armrest. And so they determined that that's what, where this owl came from. So just some little bits of uh, the um, architecture there. And then as you continue to make your way up, this is facing the opposite way. Up there on that like uh, balcony, I guess, second level. Uh, we're going to show you what, what those uh, statues are up there in a moment. We then went into a part where we actually could take pictures. Because, I don't remember why. It was really weird. Like, oh, they said that it would ruin the colors on because there were like statues that had different colors on them. They were really old. That's how yeah. they knew that they were from certain age times because of the colors that were painted on them. So supposedly you couldn't take pictures of them because your cameras would cause the colors to deteriorate faster or something like that. It was crazy. They were super, super old and they really did have color on them, which yeah. was incredible. I think that was more for flash photography. So if you were to go up there and just take pictures of, with your cell phone, it would have been okay. But there were people standing everywhere who worked <laughs> at the museum. Yes. So if you tried to get away with taking a picture, you probably would have had to leave. So unfortunately, we took no pictures in the next portion. But then we got up to another level, and this is where they had like different pieces from up there, like big pieces, but also they had models of what the Acropolis looked like. So this here was what the entrance to the Acropolis looked like. So take a moment, look at that, and now look at the actual picture. 
you can see the similarities. So this is what it looked like when it was all built up. I think the roof makes it look really, really impressive. Yeah. Like those columns are cool, but then when you think about it having a roof on top of it, way cooler. Yep. So that is what they say the entrance to the Acropolis once was. Now, this would be the Parthenon. Now, they don't know exactly what it would have looked like there on the, on the front of the roof. Uh, you can see that triangle shaped thing. We talked about that a while ago, how they tell stories with those. Uh, if you want to see a good example of this, you can see it like go to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And you can see buildings that have things like that that tell a story from history. Uh, so what they did here is they put everything in this model that they have, that they actually have excavated and, and they placed it. Um, so anyway, that is what the Parthenon would have looked like. And you can see there in the middle is... Uh, uh, person so you can kind of see the scale of how huge it is and that is the Parthenon today so there is the model with its roof and second row of columns on the inside yeah that's crazy and if you look at this picture you can kind of see some of those second columns in there they're just not all the way up and then this is the front so uh, this is what that that front with that little triangle there, and those pieces there. At the top, kind of like a little diorama kind of thing, like a scene. Yep, this is, these are the actual pieces from the Parthenon. All that they have been able to recover. <laughs> it was really funny, like this one way over on the left, like it's a person or something, and they have like a drawing of what they think it actually looked like, it was just super detailed. And you look at that and think, how in the world did they get that? from these four pieces of stone, which three of those pieces, if I just found them out in the yard, I wouldn't know that they were anything. But, it's like rocks. Yeah. But I think there are some people who are some better detectives than me too. Although I don't know if everything they did is absolutely accurate. Uh, they gave you an idea. Now these are square images that lined the whole the whole circumference of the building up above. So if we go back at this picture and you look underneath that triangle and you see there's a line with all these images and it goes across the front and then down the side. They went around the whole building and these are, this is them. And I think they actually have all of them in here. And this, this top uh, level here in the museum Cool. It's shaped to the dimensions of the Parthenon. So each of these metal pillars here represents one of the columns in the Parthenon. And then they have these, also these little dioramas here that you can see where they would have fit in and the, all the way around. And so if you look behind these two, you can see that wall back there has a whole bunch of them all side by side lined up. That's because they found all those and they put them in place here in the museum. The museum is also cool too because I think on this floor, if you turned around and looked, you could see the Parthenon. Yes, Like right. about at eye level. Yep. It felt like at eye level. So it was kind of cool. You could look at it and then look back to like the pieces that they had collected and put in the museum yep. and kind of imagine what it would have looked like that way. Yeah. And then you walk all the way around and it's your walking around the actual dimensions of the Parthenon. So here is what it looks like today. And if you look up there above the columns, you can see some of them are still in place, some of those squares. And where those ones are in place, they are actually not in the museum or else they have like a model of it, but the real one is here. So they did some like, some are here, some are in the museum, but in the museum you can see what they all look like and then they tell you the stories behind each of these pictures and what they think was happening as based on Greek mythology and everything. Now these that I told you about on that little second half level thing above the above that big hall, these are from the Erechtheon. Now the Erechtheon was this building 
right next to the Parthenon. And if you look off to the left side, you can see that little um, like dip porch that juts out. And they're all held up by these statues. Well, those ones are models or replicas. These are the real ones, all the ones that they recovered. And so these are here, and they've made that also to scale um, that foundation there so that you can see what it would have been like outside. So it is a really cool museum. The only thing that was disappointing for me was we rushed through the museum. Like, we were through it in about an hour. And I'm a person who, if I go into a museum, I want to read everything, if not almost everything that's there. And so I was going through and I was just taking pictures of everything as quickly as I could so I could look at it later because, well, we didn't have much time. So that was kind of sad, but yeah. it was a neat museum. That is what happens when you go with a group, though. Like, when you just go by yourself and do your own travels, you can kind of decide how long you want to spend somewhere. But when you're going with a tour group like that, you kind of have to follow their plan, which sometimes is good. Sometimes you get to see a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can get into things with bigger groups that you can't do by yourself. But then the, also the downside is you don't get to do, you don't get to spend time on the things maybe you would spend time on. Yeah. So it's a give and take. Mm -hmm. But I have another part to our story that I'm gonna okay. tell. So um, our the big thing in our story last time was about Abner and how he went to that fair and he had stolen money from his mom and then kind of was feeling bad about it and really didn't enjoy himself at all. But God used this in his life to help him grow and to want to be more like Jesus and to want to tell others about Jesus too. And he ended up going to Bible college and he studied at Bible college. And when he graduated, he decided he was going to visit his sister who lived in California in the United States. So he went to visit her and she had some kids um, but she was just by herself, so she asked if he would stay and help her. So he did, and he really enjoyed it. And he started to go to a Spanish-speaking church in the area. And while he was there, he met a girl named Susan, and he thought she was really uh, nice and sweet. And she told him that she was raising money to go to the Dominican Republic, and she was going to go there to teach little clubs for kids. Um, and she was going to be a missionary with child evangelism fellowship and that's actually the company that puts out all of these missionary stories that we've been doing well most of them and she said that's what she wanted to do and so she was working on her way to being a missionary for there and i never thought about it a little bit but he was like oh do i really want to be a missionary so he went and visited the Dominican Republic and he thought it was really fun and it was cool to see all these kids and to see what god was doing but he remembered what it was like to be a kid in a pastor's family and to not have very much money. And he didn't really like that idea. Like, he wasn't going to have, he was always going to have to live from one time to the other, and maybe he wouldn't have enough, and he just wasn't sure about it. So instead, he got a really great job in Guatemala. And just on the weekends, he would go help with different kids' ministries. But God began to work in his heart that money wasn't everything, and that the important thing was that he wanted to serve. And that he needed to serve and not be afraid that he wouldn't have enough and that God wouldn't provide for him. But he did decide to trust God and he did become a missionary. And he trained with Child Evangelism Fellowship, the same group that Susan did. And um, Susan came back to the U.S. to do some more training and they ended up getting married, which was really cool. So then they got to go back to the Dominican Republic together. So they would have these clubs at their house. They called them Good News Clubs. And it would be a time for the kids to come to their house. And they would teach them different Bible stories, sometimes even missionary stories, which is why these stories are even made, and about different missionaries around the world. And so one of the days when they were at um, their house getting in a Good News Club, somebody came running the, the, in the back door and she said, hurry, hurry, there's a storm coming, we need to get everyone home. So quickly they stopped with the middle of their lesson, they got the children home as fast as they could, and there was a big storm coming. It was a hurricane, it was Hurricane David, um, is what they named it. And um, after they got the children all settled in their house, they went to a camp, and that's where a lot of other people are trying to escape from the storm, and so they all stayed at this big camp to wait and see 
um, how the storm was going to blow over. Well, it was a very, very intense hurricane. And they were all staying like in a big shelter area for um, the main time of it. And the group of people that was in there had to keep going back and forth between the different sets of windows because when the hurricane is coming in, it, it's hit the island, it puts so much pressure on the outside, you can actually break windows. So what they would do is they would run from one end of the building, open up the windows to let some of the pressure out, and then close them real quick so they didn't get all the rain in, and then they go to the other end of the building and open up the windows and let some of the pressure out so that it didn't break the windows in the building and then let in all this rain during the storm. And actually, when I was on Guam, we talked about this when we got ready for um, typhoons, which are like hurricanes. They talked about watching your windows to see if they were starting to bow, and that way you could be prepared to kind of re release some of that pressure so they wouldn't break and make a big mess everywhere. Um, and at one point during their storm, um, they watched the strong winds of the hurricane pull the roof off of a building and dump it into another building. But they were safe. God protected them through the whole thing. Well, finally, the storm was over. And um, they went out to look around at the camp and at the, at the area where they lived. And it was a mess. The roofs were gone off of houses. Trees were knocked over. There were branches and debris everywhere. And Susan said, look at our home. It's ruined. There's nothing standing. All the buildings were damaged. There was no electricity. There was no propane that they could use for cooking. And there wasn't even gas for their cars. What were they going to do? And how is God going to use this? You're going to have to come back next time. See how they recover from their storm. Wow. That is crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> Those are some serious storms. There's one thing about rain. But when you go through like typhoon or hurricane, it's a way different mm -hmm. kind of storm. <laughs> I believe it. Don't really want to experience it, but I believe it. <laughs> okay, so now we are going to tell you about the Mackey family. And I told you a couple episodes ago that we did a missions trip with the Mackeys this summer. And so now I'm going to tell you little more specifically about their ministry. So they are with International ASL Ministry. Uh, the, the ministry that they actually work for is International Partnership Ministries, but they are specifically over the ASL part of that ministry. So here's a picture of the Mackies, and I'm sorry, it's not as clear because this is a picture of a picture. <laughs> but this is the only picture I have of them all together. We were in Denver um, this fall, and uh, as in Alyssa and I, and baby Jade and baby Jocelyn, and we got to see all of them. So that was Alyssa's first time meeting them. And so that was really neat to see them all, to have supper with them just to talk about life and ministry. I first met the Mackies in 2015 and he told me at the time that he would like me to come out and visit their ministry in California because we met in Iowa and so we were able to work it out that I could go out and spend about a week with them and so this is from the first time I went out. I went out to take pictures for them so that they could use it uh, to help tell others about their ministry. Uh, so while I was there, I got to gather with their church of deaf and hard to hear people. And he let me teach on Sunday morning. And so there I am speaking while he is interpreting for me. And then he also took me to Oakland and showed me some of the people who he has served and so this guy is working at a at a place downtown in Oakland and so I got to hear his story and then he also in addition to seeing the ch their church there in the San Francisco area he also took me to one of his Bible studies that he did at a at a uh, group home and so this is him and what I love about ASL is that when they are speaking, they're using their hands, but a lot of what they're 
saying you can see in their face. Mm -hmm. So they're not speaking verbally, but all the emotions and everything are still shown in the face. And in, I don't remember what story he was telling here, but he put on these sunglasses to add to the whole thing. <laughs> and it was, it was really neat. And so that was when they lived in California. They have since transitioned to Denver, Colorado area, and they are working with the church there, but he is still working uh, with the international uh, ministry side of things. And so he's doing like double duty and actually, I believe right now they are in Kenya. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Pastor Mackie and his wife. So the, all the kids are at home. <laughs> <laughs> and they are serving um, and meeting people over in Kenya. So this is from our summer missions trip there a few months ago uh, when we were with their church there in Denver and sharing testimonies and he was interpreting for us. And I showed you this picture where he's telling us about some of the stories of his international travels and um, speaking through sign language, different sign language, not always ASL, but sometimes in uh, the different sign languages of the various countries. So he's telling us about his experiences there. And then we interviewed him as well. So rather than me trying to tell you all that he does, we're going to show you this video and let him tell you more about his ministry. Today I'm here with Pastor Mackey and we're going to learn some new things about his ministry. So Pastor Mackey, when did you first come to faith? Well, hello. And I came to faith when I was seven years old in a small Baptist church in New York State. It happened that night that the pastor made a relationship between death and hell. And I was scared because I knew about death growing up on a farm. I saw dead cows and dead cats, and I did not want to be dead that way. So after church that night, I tapped my mom and I said, Mom, I do not want to die because the pastor said, if you die without Jesus, you will go to hell. My mother that night explained with me that I didn't need to be scared of the first death, but I should be scared of the second separation from God in hell eternally. And so I needed to bow and to pray and to ask Jesus to forgive my sins. That's how I became saved. So when growing in your faith, when did you decide, I want to work in the death ministry? I was around the age of 26 when God touched my heart through the preaching of Mark chapter 7 verses 31 through 37, and it happened that someone was preaching about the deaf in the New Testament, and Jesus, of course, healed the deaf person. But I was fascinated because it says, Jesus, looking up to heaven, he sighed. And I thought, I've never seen that word, and I don't know why Jesus sighed. We sigh because we're tired, we're sick of something, and I thought, I don't think that Jesus is doing that because of that. And so I thought and I thought up until I recognized it was his compassion for the deaf that I needed to go ahead and to learn sign language. Awesome. So what is the purpose of your ministry? The purpose of the ministry is really two. First, here we have a church for the deaf and the purpose relates with allowing people who are deaf to use their reasonable abilities to serve the Lord. Secondly, our goal is to outreach new people who are in the deaf community that don't know about Jesus Christ and the gospel. What is one thing you want everyone to know about the deaf community? Probably the most important thing about the deaf community to understand is that Jesus died for all creatures. The Bible says that. And the deaf community is very, very isolated in that many, many deaf people do not know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the things that we have noticed is that the cults have um, accessed the deaf community way ahead of many, many Christian churches. And so the devil has gone ahead and crept in and given lies before we arrive there. And so I want you to understand that it's a very, very difficult area to 
um, access and uh, to pray that God will open the eyes of the deaf community. And lastly, what is one way or many ways we can continue to support you? Well, the priority is prayer. Jesus Christ said that we need to pray the Lord of Harvest, uh, that you will send workers. Uh, when I joined into deaf ministry, there were one in three deaf churches and ministries that had a full-time worker. That means what? 66% do not have a worker. This is true in my experience. I've seen many, many churches that will ask us, please move to our church and help establish or um, establish a uh, again a ministry that was there before and we have to tell them no that God has called us here and we're going to continue up until God closes the door and so we need your prayer and your hearts to be thinking about your time here maybe you know someone who will be willing to come and help with the deaf and uh, that will be just a great blessing okay well thank you for sharing your time with us yeah. You're welcome. Though. So that is a good overview of Pastor Mackey and his family and how they serve. I showed you this picture before of us, our group with them before we came back to Minnesota at the end of our trip. Uh, but it, you can see in there Pastor Mackey and his wife standing there in the back. Uh, what's neat about them is after they felt God calling them into this ministry uh, they were both engineers and so they went to school he got um, he studied so that he could both sign and interpret but more on the sign of, side of just si signing but she actually is a like a certified interpreter and so uh, he says that uh, if people want someone to interpret for them, she's the better option because she knows it better and he, he more got into it so that he could preach. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, not that he can't also interpret, but and he does a very good job of it too. Uh, but he says that she's more skilled at it and um, she also didn't have as many things. She wasn't working a full-time job and all these things while going to school like he had to. Uh, but I like it when I'm with them and everybody's talking because as you can see they have a big family so a lot goes on but in the background if they want to talk to each other they'll just start signing to each other <laughs> it's across really, the room yeah and it's like well no one's interrupting them or anything and they just have to be able to see each other and I've seen it so many times when I'm with them they'll just start talking to each other but you won't hear it you'll just <laughs> see it it's pretty so, funny yeah but a lot of their kids uh, have learned ASL, of course, too, and and know it very well and can help. Um, it, you, they can interpret for you, too, if you're trying to talk to somebody and they're there, so that's really helpful. But I'm just so thankful for this family and how God is using them, and um, they are very busy people, but God has done a lot of great things through them, and I'm excited to see how he will continue to bless their ministry in the future. And... They really love kids. Like, the kids love kids, which yeah. is really funny. So we got to hang out with them the one day. They were so excited to play with Jocelyn and Jaden. And at the end, they all lined up, like, in a row so they all could get a turn to hold Jocelyn. <laughs> it was pretty funny. So they yeah. were super friendly, and we had a great time hanging out with them. And it's really, it's really fun to see missionaries and to remember that they're just normal people like us, mm -hmm. but God has given them a love for a special group of people. And for them, it's the people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Yeah. And that group of people kind of is lonely if you stop and think about it. Like technology's made a lot of things easier for them, but there's a lot of things that our world isn't set up for people who can't hear. And we just take it for granted. So if you just stop some time and realize how much you listen and how much you rely on listening mm. and hearing that things that way, and then think about what it's like for someone who doesn't have that skill, the world would be a very quiet place and kind of hard to get to figure everything out. Um, so it's incredible. If you get to the chance to learn some sign language, you might really make somebody's day someday when you get to meet somebody um, who can't speak out loud or can't hear and that you would want to make that effort to communicate with them yep 
Yeah, as, as Alyssa was talking about that, it just reminded me of how when we put together these videos and the sound's not working, or we go halfway through before we find out that the sound has stopped, uh, we have to start all over. And for them, that's not an issue. Sound isn't, I mean, if we could, if we could just sign the whole way through, that's not a big deal to them. But like, like Liz said, we rely so much on our hearing that when these things go wrong, it messes things up for us. Uh, but these people, they can't rely on their hearing. And so um, it doesn't matter how much you play things, you talk to them. If, if they can't see you, it, it's totally different. And so being able to communicate with these people is a big deal. And it's something I have been challenged to try to work on so that I can expand my the people that I can reach. Yeah, even just a few greetings I'm sure would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Be really encouraging to somebody. Mm -hmm. So you should look up, there's lots of videos out there, lots of YouTubes on different things you can learn to say and it's just be a fun little skill to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you come back next time and learn some more. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Bye.